got friends, only wanna talk business. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting down the stars. Yeah, cause when it rain, then it pours. Yeah, and I'm ready for some more. Yeah, and I've been reading all the work. What's up, Kevin Hill? Not much. Man. Excited <laughs> about the basketball theme today. I pulled out my oh, yeah. Air Jordans, so the retro ones. I my parents would never buy me as a child, and uh, wearing those today. Well, how, what did those run you? Did you have to get them off eBay? Did you have to wait in line at the mall? Well, how did you go about getting them? No, you, I just walked into to Foot Locker or somewhere a few years ago and, and bought them. The, you know. Uh-huh. So they're, they're, they're the new reproduction, so they're not like limited editions or anything. So it's like a hundred dollar pair of sneakers. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned basketball. This show is all about sales lessons that we've learned from the Last Dance, which uh, proved to be one of the uh, one of the best shows, one of the best programs that has gotten a lot of people through lockdown and the quarantine. We've had this. We've had uh, the Tiger King. If you wanted to feel better about yourself, you've had. Uh, we had a multitude of different things, but the one that really stuck out to me and to a lot of people, I think, on LinkedIn was the parallels between the teachings of Phil Jackson and the work ethic of Michael Jordan and those Bulls teams and the 90s and how that can actually translate to entrepreneurs, to salespeople, to working professionals and just for your own uh, inspirative goals. You're exactly right. It's all about commitment, persistence, uh, ability you know, being prepared, being present. You know, there was a big quote that, that we'll probably focus on quite a bit today is is being in the moment, being present, all those things, being really highly competitive, maybe super competitive, maybe so competitive that nobody likes you. Uh, <laughs> but, but all of those, all, all those key ingredients is, is the same as sales, sports, anything where you're competing and, and going after one another. I even watched the bonus feature. So I watched The Last Dance, but then I went back in time and I watched Space Jam and a wonderful movie with Bill Murray and uh, and uh, and Michael Jordan is there taken up to to play on the, the Toon team against the Monstars on um, Planet Moron. And uh, maybe our, our guys at NASA at some point can get us an uplink to, uh, to Planet Moron. <laughs> maybe so. I don't know if I've ever watched Space Jam. I, I think I probably have, but it's been so long that I can't really remember anything except Michael Jor- Jordan, Bill Murray, and cartoons. Bugs Bunny. Oh, and, uh, Bugs Bunny's in it, right? He is in all the all most of the tunes. Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny, Marvin the Martian, yeah. the, the whole the whole crew's there. Uh, although you know those characters have fallen off. Like my kids, they're three and five. They don't Bugs and and the gang. They need something new because. Right now, they're not inspired by them at all. Like Moana, they're into and uh, and that kind of stuff, but nothing to do with the Looney Tunes. A couple of people in the comments, Eric Serta said he's refilling his coffee even though he's not a closer. Don't tell anyone. I just told everyone, Eric, but feel free to drink it on us, especially if it's decaf. Stan Duncan says, uh, deep bow of gratitude to uh, to Dooner and Kevin Hill. Same to you, sir. Matthew Berg says, uh, hey, Eric Serta. Uh, Matthew Har- Mark Horowitz says, it's hump day. It sure is. And Gregory Gryan says, good morning, all. And, yeah, that's the nice thing about put that coffee down. We're right set dead center in the middle of hump day. And at Freightways Live at Home, we were right dead center in that program, too. We were 12 p.m. Eastern time every Wednesday. And it is strange. The Looney Tunes, that they kind of just died away. They, they haven't created anything new in, in a long time. And I wonder why that is because they're an integral part of, of both of our childhoods. Uh, but it just seems like they just uh, they haven't created anything in a long time. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of waning in my in my child, to be honest, Kevin. No, uh, they were... well, uh, yeah, you, you know that much younger than I am. I had Transformers and I had G.I. Joe. Yeah, that kind of stuff was uh, was was resonant with uh, with me. But you know what? This show resonates with this show resonates with Hub Tech. This month's Put That Coffee Down is sponsored by HubTech. HubTech just launched Tabby. Have you heard about it? It's a new task automation bot that helps you focus on what matters. To learn more, visit GoHubTech.com. And you know what? Trey Griggs will be joining us to break down the survey a little bit later, do his elevator pitch. And uh, this is a topic I know he can get up for. I know he can, too. He loves basketball, loves Michael Jordan, and he's going to be full of great insights when we get to the survey, wrapping the survey into to lessons learned from the last dance. Speaking of which, do you, so the match, I know that the match was one of your favorite programs that aired all throughout lockdown. What would you think about Michael Jordan going with uh, Tiger or Phil and Phil or Tiger pairing up with, I don't know, the Tiger King and, and doing, doing some golf? <laughs> I would love that. I would like love to see Jordan out there competing. 
and see him probably gambling on, on each hole as he went. And I would say it would be great to have him paired uh, with the, the, the other basketball great, Charles Barkley. But I've seen Charles Barkley play golf, and I, I don't know if that would be very competitive whatsoever. What about it looks I- like Barkley's horrible. Isaiah Thomas, yes. <laughs> you got to get that. They, they might come to blows. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit about having that chip on your shoulder and sometimes just identifying that rival fair or unfair, that person that just fuels you for some people. It's their dad. For some people, it's a, uh, it's just a, it's just a up here, right. Or, a, or someone in a rival organization that you just want to mm-hmm. be better than mm-hmm. and you, for whatever reason, you can't stand them. And, uh, and one thing we learned about Michael Jordan is that he constantly found new ways mm-hmm. to motivate himself to get up every day and to excel on the court yeah he would find a foe i i think that's uh that's what comes from the last dance a lot of times whatever he needed to motiv- motivate himself to out compete outperform to, to beat other people he found it he'd, he'd go searching for it he'd go searching for his foe to to motivate him put that chip on his shoulder and take off well, here's our quote for today. It's, it's from Michael Jordan in 1984 during his rookie season, and he didn't even look outside the organization. He looked internally. He says, from the first day in practice, my mentality was, whoever is the team leader on that team, I'm going after him. And I'm not going to do it with my voice because I had no voice. I had no status. I had to do it with the way I played. And uh, I think that you can do that in healthy and non-toxic ways. You just have to be careful, right? You have to make sure that... Uh, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing. That's the great thing about organizations, whoever you nominate or whoever rises to the pillar, hope that they're good because the rest of your team, they can only raise that high. And then you get someone great like Michael Jordan is going to aspire to be even better. I think he's very healthy because he's not trying to do it with his voice. He's not asking or he's not demanding something. He's going to go out there and work for it. He's going to go out there and perform, let his play speak his words. And it goes back to the old saying, actions speak louder than words. And that's exactly what this quote is all about. He's going to let his actions make him the the team leader at some point. And the quicker, the better in his case. Gregory Grimes says, good morning, all. Michael Nemey uh, says, Trey Griggs is the goat. And Patty Hinosa said, her coffee's down. She's listening. We had a couple comments when we put this topic up. Chris Jolly, he's uh, the freight coach, a uh, longtime listener. He says, the best leadership lesson I learned is the value in leading yourself in life and your role within an organization. Not everyone is MJ or the superstar, but he is nothing without his teammates. His teammates lead themselves in their roles to make themselves the best role players possible to set the team up for success. Looking forward to this. And that's a really interesting point, too, because the the players on his team, they recognize that uh, Michael Jordan is, is as good as he is. And in fact, before you saw this documentary, you probably heard a lot about his reputation as being this demanding, driving um hole, right? That would, that would just put everyone out there. But I think what you find out when you watch the documentary is that it's entirely forgivable because he spends more time practicing more time on the court and more time dedicated. And that inability to turn the game off that all you can do is sit there and go, you know what? This guy's really putting the effort in and he is that damn good. So I better just find my place and ride that wave. Exactly right. And that's what you have with Scotty Pippen, Dennis Rodman, uh, that they couldn't tune it in like Jordan could because Jordan was always present. He couldn't turn the game off. That's all he did that he leave, lived, breathed, and, and just competed. And, and basketball was, was the primary competition that he did. That's what he's a superstar about. But his whole life is one big competition. Uh, but, but you have to have that person, and then you have to have the, the role players in there to, to, to help him out and, and do the things that he couldn't do. You know what I found interesting, though? It was the parallel between maybe Michael Jordan, then you had Kobe Bryant and LeBron. Kobe Bryant and LeBron, maybe for, for good reason, they, they took they took a lot more heat. And I know they, they grew up in the internet era where Michael Jordan only had to worry about what sports writers would really say about him and then, you know, what people may say at the bar. But he didn't have as much acrimony. There's a lot of fan acrimony coming coming at him. Even Bruno Delilo, he says he's a global sales director at Legacy Supply Service. He said, excited for the show. He wasn't a Michael Jordan fan growing up, but watching this documentary, I found a new level of appreciation in my sales role for him. And uh, Bruno, if you'd like to elaborate that on more, I'm really curious too, what aspect of it really helped uh, fill that out for you? For me? 
Uh, well, for for you as well. I mean, did you have any acrimony towards Jordan? I mean, for oh, for, for us, he kind of grew up. For us, he was sort of like a uh, he transcended basketball. He's like Tiger Woods in golf. He got people to watch basketball who didn't watch basketball, and that is the true hallmark of a great. They bring people in who wouldn't tune in. That's how you scale organizations by mm -hmm. bringing viewers mm -hmm. who wouldn't be there otherwise. Yeah, you know, when I was growing up, so so basically I grew up in the late '80s, early '90s, and he was the, by far the the greatest athlete. The greatest talent, the greatest athlete. He transcended uh, sports in the way that you know few other people really have in the past and and since that time, where he was an international superstar. It kind of goes in 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 there in the last dance after Olympics, but he was always uh, a must-watch player. You know, whenever the the Bulls were on, you, you had to sit down and watch and see what Jordan would do. And in that transcendent and that shoe contract that is Asian from outside of basketball, tried to, to position him as like a tennis player or a golf player, someone without a team, kind of an individual sport. So you had the shoes, you had, you had all kinds of, of different things on, on Jordan. And, and uh, you know, I, LeBron is kind of like that. There, there's other people, but not to the extent that, that Jordan was back in the late 80s and, and all throughout the 90s. It's, I like that you mentioned shoes as well, because Nike wasn't known for their uh, athletic sneakers. The whole Air Jordan thing kind of ushered in sneaker culture in America. I mean, it had such a Nike. huge, it's such, yeah, such a huge influence on, on Nike, on Phil Knight, on, on, on the product and, and how shoes are marketed and sold now. And also I remember, if you remember this in like 1990, when the Air Jordans came out, 89, those were like, Oh my God, people would get, would get killed for those shoes. It would be like, yeah, yes. it's $130, $1989 sneakers. You know, this is super expensive. I remember like in order to get some, my mom was like, you have to get on the honor roll, you know, the next three years or something, which I wasn't incapable of doing. So I never got my Jordans, but, um, <laughs> but it, it was a cultural movement. It was, it was fascinating. And those things don't always have happen in sports. It's very hard to transcend. It's hard to transcend in business. And what we saw too is none of it was easy. None of it was easy. No, none of it was easy whatsoever. I mean, he, uh, he, he worked and no matter what you think, you, he amazing talent, amazing ability, but he worked, he out, as you said earlier, he outworked everybody. He out prepared everybody. He out thought everybody and he was more competitive than anybody. And that's, that was that, that small, but significant difference, but between great and goat, the greatest of all time. Michael Neme, he says, uh, and maybe, Kevin, I don't know if you're amendable to this. Maybe we can give this away next week. He says, the book Relentless, From Good to Great to Unstoppable by Tim Grover. If you haven't read it, it's an amazing book, and it's a breakdown on Michael Jordan, Kobe, and LeBron. Uh, Michael, if you think it parallels uh, a bit into sales and dovetails into this topic really well, we'll strongly consider it. Right, Kevin? We will, yes. Uh, Hope White, she wrote, I would want to. Hope White, we asked her how what she learned from The Last Dance and, and what message that she learned from Michael Jordan she could do. She's the CEO at HD White Logistics, and she had a really insightful comment. She said, I would want to know and fully believe I am the sole deciding factor in my success and confidently build my brand and business around that mindset. The unwavering confidence and continuous development of Mike's craft, despite stumbling blocks placed in front. And you know what? I, and that's, that's an interesting thing is in organizations, you can come into situations where there's that line between enabling someone who's an a-hole and enabling someone so they can be great and finding the difference. And I think the difference has to do with the output that they provide. It's, it's definitely based on the output and, and basically working harder than anybody else on, 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 on Hope's comment, it's, uh, you know, you, you watch documentaries, you, you, your memories go back in the past, and it's all about Michael Jordan's wins, right? Uh, but, but the documentary shows all those losses, you know, two, three years of losing to the Pistons. Uh, if you imagine, uh, if you go back and you watched a, a full season in any of those uh, 90s teams, you're going to find a lot of really bad games that, that Michael Jordan played. And it's that, that persistence and that, that learning from each and every mistake and each and every season to, to, to go forward and, and just get better and better over time. Bruno, Bruno DeLillo, he, he put some context to this. He says, what I meant was, you knew he was a great basketball player, but his drive to be the best, his will to succeed, and like Kevin Hill said, finding motivation. If he didn't have motivation against someone specific, he made it up. 
Sometimes we have to set goals and create competition within your organization industry. Can you take your abilities to the next level? Now, sometimes companies try to do this in soft ways, like with gamification and those kind of things. But Michael Jordan really had this pure output for himself. Now, the one thing about basketball is you literally have a scoreboard up there and you literally have a scorecard and a field goal percentage and all of those kind of things. To, to see, but when you are the best, I mean, this is a team that three peated twice. So he, he has to wake up knowing he's the best at it, but still motivate himself to not rest on his laurels and to never be satisfied. And Kevin, we touched on this on a previous episode that the problem with, with that kind of drive, the only negative problem is that you're never satisfied and you're never happy with what you did. And that, that can affect you a little bit. And there's, there's also a balance that sometimes you need to strike there. And it's hard to find it when you're really trying to be great because the goal is always to make the next thing better, which means the previous thing just wasn't good enough. You, you're exactly right. If you take it to Michael Jordan level of competitiveness is it's almost sociopathic behavior in, in a lot of ways, right? I mean, you have uh, does he have a gambling problem or a competitive par- problem? You know, it, to, to have that, that drive to, to, to be the best every single time and go out and three-peat and three-peat again. Uh, and it's it, it takes a lot, lot out of you. And you kind of see that in documentary, too, is, is that, that joy of winning turns into uh, just, you know, a relief that you won because you, you're expected to. Steven Jack says Jordan had a terrible reputation for years, but I honestly think this documentary has helped his image to be on that level of competition and to win constantly. You're not in a, you're not in it for a popularity contest and you can't do it alone. But then again, he cheated Pippen out of money every game with that Jumbotron halftime scan. So maybe he is a jerk. Yeah. I don't necessarily know if that's in dispute. The other thing he used to do too, was bet players on the team that his bags would come off the luggage carousel first. And then he would go and he'd be, he'd, pay the baggage handlers. He'd pay them off to make sure his came out first. So anything to win, even if you got a cheat, apparently for MJ. I know, right? It, 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 he takes it to such a level and there's other athletes out there who take it to, to such a level that, that their competitive streak is, is so, so high that it does become sort of sociopathic behavior, but, but you, I, you probably need that to be the greatest fall time. Now, you've seen the Rodman episode, and Jake McLeod, he's the CCO at RPM. He said he liked the way that Phil handled Rodman, and and for Rodman, he will be our archetype of sort of that that really good personality who can show up, uh, who shows up to work, but you never know wh- what time he's coming back to the hotel room at night or any of that kind of stuff. He said he liked the way Phil handled Rodman. You need to understand all the personalities on your team and what each one needs from you. A younger coach would have tried to clamp down on Robin, but Phil knew this is what he needed to be able to perform at his best. And he would get every ounce out of him. Just like in sales, leaders, leaders need to be chameleon sometimes and be able to change based on the circumstances and who they're dealing with. You know, in, in some ways, Rodman... I, I, I compare you to Rodman a little bit. Oh. <laughs> you, sometimes you're out of control. Sometimes you're hard to handle. You're different, right? But you're great. Sure. But, but you're great, yep. and you just have to, to be able to, to, to work with, with every personality type that comes in. That was Phil Jackson's kind of, uh, you know, that was his specialty. And, and watching the documentary and, and talking to Stan Duncan, I, I can see a lot of similarities between those two. Yeah, you know, and I think as much credit as Jordan gets, I think in terms of management, the, how Phil Jackson handled that team is a uh, is a textbook example of, of something that that man, sales manager should be looking into for the way he was able to mold these different personalities to work as a cohesive unit. Because some of those, like we mentioned, Jordan's drive, Jordan's push, his determination, the way he treated his teammates, especially if he thought that they weren't pushing hard enough, could be seen as very toxic in some organizations if it's not put in the same light. Dennis Rodman taking off to show up on WCW night Nitro and at pay-per-views and hanging out with uh, Hulk Hogan, all that kind of stuff could seem like a huge distraction. And the Bulls even did something you're usually told not to do in management, and that's make special rules for special people. But he also realized that in reality, sometimes you do have to make those rules or those concessions to make the whole thing work. And you have to make some hard decisions. And that's that makes draconian rulemaking very tough. Yeah, the whole Rodman vacation to, to Vegas. 
and the way Michael Jordan and, you know, Phil Jackson handled it the way Phil Jackson did. But I, I was surprised to see, you know, Jordan handled it very well. He's like, yeah, he needs a vacation, you know. And, uh, and basically, you probably won't see him in 48 hours. But he knew that – he knew the Rodman's personality too. And although Jordan was, was highly competitive and, and wanted everyone to, to give out maximum effort, uh, he respected Rodman a lot because he just knew that he just – in, in a lot of ways, just wasn't all there, and he had to do what Raman does. And coming back and getting in shape and doing those laps around uh, Indians, Indian laps or Indian sprints, I, I forget exactly what they call them, uh, and, and being surprised that, you know, even with Rodman's, all Rodman's difficulties, he was always in shape. He was always ready to play when he was on the court. One of Jordan's sort of credos on there was this relentless dedication to being the best at what he did. And it's a value system that forces you to evaluate and improve yourself and just constantly get better. And, and we touched on earlier is, is maintaining that sort of in balance without being too toxic and without getting everyone. Cause you, like, like people said, it's not a popularity contest. You're not going to make a lot of friends. If you come in with all that drive, if you're working 60 hours a week and everyone's working 40 hours a week, you're going to get the stink eye, even though you're helping the organization organization because the, and especially if you don't involve the role players well, but the thing is, the thing is winning or closing deals is a great panacea to some of these problems that can cure a lot of toxicity. I, you're exactly right. Winning, closing deals, creating revenue, generating revenue. Uh, when, once you're doing that, then, then everything kind of goes away. When you start losing, when you start not closing deals, that's when you really see the toxicity, toxicity and, and problems that the, are underneath the surface. Winning kind of cures all that. One thing that Jordan adopted very early on, uh, and he adopted it at maybe one of the harder times, is that that belief that you can win. He wasn't the best yet in college, you know, and he everyone knows he got cut from his high school team, but he believed that he could win. He believed that he could be better, and he had talked about that conversation with his his mom, and, and with, that was a bit of a turning point, a coach. And, and Michael Jordan, one thing I really picked up is that he constantly looks for that motivation, that push from family, that push from from teammates, that push from rivals, that uh, that push from the coach. I mean, the only thing I have to say about the coach is he didn't he didn't pay that much reverence to Phil, and I thought Phil had a much bigger role than maybe sometimes, and maybe it was just the way that it was edited. But how did you feel about that? I, you know, I, I think um, I, I think Michael Jordan has a, a big ego, and he's going to uh, he he's he's going to center everything around himself and around his persistence and and and, and his performance. So it doesn't really surprise me too much. I, I do, I, you know, he got really uh, upset with um, the, the general ma manager Jerry Krause about you know organizations win championships, and uh, and that really set him off. So he's he's Michael Jordan centered, and kind of the attitude you need to to be the greatest uh, is that persistence. You know, and and he's kind of like a Looney Tunes in, in a lot of ways. Just his mentality, his natural abilities, and then his mentality is kind of over the top. He also said that he talked about the power of the player coach, right? Which is a, a convenient thing for him to say, because he was a player coach at the time. And, mm -hmm. and it sort of validates uh, some of his, um, his distaste for, for Kraus and maybe sometimes his, I, I don't want to say dismissiveness of Phil, because it's clear that he liked Phil, but he also says things like this that undercut him a little. He said, I would never let someone who is not putting on a uniform and playing each and every day dictate what I do on the court or what we do on the court. Let's focus on our craft. Let's give them a reason not to think that way, which is also, that's a great sentence. So at the end, let's give them a reason not to think that way. So take ownership of your career, take ownership of your sales, take ownership of your CRM, and let's not let them take the power away from management to dictate to you, to you because you are doing such a good job and because you do have that drive and because they do notice. Yeah, it, it takes the focus. You have to, to be focused. You have to be persistent. So, you know, all these different qualities uh, that makes a great salesperson. If, if you're doing that on your own, you're controlling your own destiny. You're closing your own deals. It doesn't matter who's managing you. Right. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter if you are just out there hustling, working, closing deals, management issues, whoever's your coach or manager, uh, it kind of falls by the, the wayside. It's just like, get out of my way. Let me do my thing. He 
says, uh, he also said this about Krauss. He was talking about toxic management. He said the most important part of the process uh, in, in terms of winning a championship is the players. For him to say that is offensive to how I approach the game. And that's Jordan on Jerry Krauss saying players alone don't win championships. Organizations do. And I got a question. Do you think that he fully means that? Or do you think that that's Jordan being Jordan? And he had to identify yet another person to fuel him, which was Jerry Krauss, another person to just give the middle finger to to get him up in the morning. I've been to organizations and, and sometimes it's helpful to have someone in the organization that's higher up than you that you dislike. Sometimes it does help. Sometimes it drives you. I, I, I think it's Jordan being Jordan. I, I think it's, it's, it's creating an enemy. Uh, and then there's probably all kinds of other issues between him and Jerry Krauss. Uh, but this is a, a good soundbite for him to go out and repeat and, and talk to the press about. And, you know, it's, it's basically, uh, it is a F you, right? You know, it's, 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 you know, it's my team. Uh, we're the players. We're the greatest assets. But Jerry Cross is right. It takes organizations to to, to win win multiple championships. The, the players are the, the the most important ingredient. But without a, a healthy organization that's putting all the right pieces together, uh, you're not going to win championships. Well, it's low standards too, and and letting low standards define an organization. Feeling if you make your team feel like you you gave up on them, your sales team. Oh, this month's already a wash. Even those kind of things. The effect that that can have on people can be quite profound. And for Michael Zordon, it was the mistrust the mistrust that Michael had with management, specifically Jerry Krause, was he believed they violated the most fundamental aspect of the sport, of the most fundamental aspect of the way Michael Jordan conducted his life. You do it at the highest level, and you do it to win all the time. From the moment on, from that moment on Michael's relationship with ownership and management was deeply sour. That never went away. And that was, uh, that was his teammates talking about him there. Yeah. And I, I don't know what year was, do you know what year that was? Yeah, it was, it was uh, after their fifth championship and all those rumors okay. were swirling about that they were going to get rid of Pippen and, and he was holding out and actually wasn't with them for what it was the first 12 or 15 games of uh, that final season. Yeah, that was a very toxic environment. You know, you have the general manager coming out saying, Phil Jackson, this is going to be Phil Jackson's last year. We don't know what we're going to do with Pippen. We are going to uh, to, to rebuild after this uh, during a, a championship a season that could be in, I guess, all through the season of a championship run. I mean, you know, who really does that? It's like, yeah, yeah. this is a, the last dance. We're breaking it up after this. You know, and he brings a culture of, in a sense, insensitivity. This is from Bill Wellington. He said leaders can be more about business than protecting feelings. And this is very true. It is the real world. He said he's not worried about hurting your feelings. If your feelings are hurt, you can leave. He'll gladly tell you, if you don't want to be here, get out. We don't need you here. And I've had that that same mentality working with uh, with people in, in any role I've been in. If they come in and they don't want to be at the job and they don't believe in the vision, they don't believe in the goal and they're not working towards it, then I don't want to be around them. I don't want to work with them because they are inhibiting our ability as a team. Yeah, I, th I think that's what managers face constantly all the time, especially in, in, in the, you know, the, the corporate environment are, are people that don't want to be here. You know, uh, people who don't want to be there, people who are disconnected from their jobs. I, I think I, I saw a survey the other day, 70% 70, 70 of employees are, are disconnected from their jobs. And, you know, to fill uh, an office space full of people that are really connected or playing at a high level is a very difficult challenge to do. So it's something that, that managers uh, are constantly struggling with. Two quick ones, and then I'm going to dial up Trey Griggs. One was confidence. We, we mentioned that earlier. He And this is from Michael Jordan. He says, that game-winning shot changed my name from Mike to Michael Jordan. That gave me confidence that I needed to start to excel at the game of basketball. And it changed the name in his own head before it changed it in the press or anywhere else. He found that thing to say, you know what? I don't suck at this, and now I know I can grow and get better. I know I can complete the game. The other one was, make sure that you know where you stand with people so words don't distract. And I think that's one thing that I, as harsh as Michael Jordan could be, he would tell you whatever he's saying uh, in a meeting with Phil Jackson or out there on the court. There's no surprises. There's no hiding there. And in sales, one of the, the biggest anxiety you can have when I was in sales was when you really feel like you're not doing well, you know, your numbers are coming in, but your manager says, ah, it's just fine because you know that not only is it not fine, but now they're a liar too. Yeah. And going back to the confidence thing, you know, whether you're in sales, whether you're in broadcasting, sports, you always want the ball. You know, that, that's the confidence, right? You always want the ball. You always want the deal. You always want that, that hard-to-close prospect. You always want that, that hard-to-move load. You want the ball. You know, you want the mic 
Dooner. You want you always want the mic. You always want you want, always want the action, and that comes with confidence. And that's uh, that's when you know you're playing at a high level, and no matter what you're doing in life. No, I mean, and it's true. And when I look at, at, at podcasting or my craft, I also look at what everyone else is doing in the space, not, not just this space, but throughout the industry. And I'm always looking to try and escalate this as much as I can and to make it as, as best as it can. This is what I do for a career. This is what I dedicate my life to. I'm impassioned by it. And it makes me, it makes me bring that dedication to it. And I probably am not behind the scenes. I'm not always the easiest person to work with because I, I expect some perfection as well. I expect things to work a certain way. And if they're not, I want to know that people are working to make them improved and to fix them. And that, that, that comes with dedication. It's hard to unplug from that. And it, 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 bring, it, it makes you rattled sometimes. It, it does. It does. But if you're not doing that, you're not going to get better. You're not going to improve and success isn't going to, uh, to, to be on your door. Let's bring uh, let's bring Trey yep. Griggs on up let's hear from him. Let's get his elevator pitch rocking on here. And, uh, and we'll talk to him all about this documentary that I know that he's a big fan of. He's the global director of sales for HubTech. I know a lot of people in the comments here are familiar with him. Let me try one more time because it wasn't dialing. Let's dial it up one more time. Trey, and here, make sure you're in a coverage area. Mr. Trey Griggs, if you're listening along, trying to bring you up right now. Another good quote from Phil Jackson that you have listed here is a Japanese proverb. Fall down seven times, stand up eight. That's all it takes. <laughs> yes, it, that's, that's all, that's that's all it takes. That all it takes. And you think about all these game fives, all these game sevens, uh, whether it's basketball, baseball, it's just a very tiny difference between the winners and losers. Hey, Trey Griggs, thanks for joining us on the air. We were trying to get through to you. For some reason, the phone just wasn't dialing through. I'm not sure if you're in, or if you're in a strange coverage area or something, but we're, we're glad we got you up on the air, man. Yeah, no worries. Good to talk to you guys. Uh, thanks for calling, and uh, hopefully we have a good connection this uh, whole time. Yeah, we've been we well, we've been talking about you. Know, you've seen the last dance, right? What was your, what was your biggest takeaway from that? Well, before I can answer that question, Dinner, I have to tell you that Emily put me up to having an intro rap. Oh, uh, for this session, and I actually have one. It'll take about fifty seconds. You got time for that? Can I lay it down? Le- yes, we, uh, you have the floor. Oh, excellent! All right, here we go. So I have to give credit to Obi Trice. This is one of my favorite background musical instrumentals. All right. So everybody ready for this? Well, hold on a second. Right? If that's if that's copyright, you gotta turn that down real low. <laughs> I will turn it down real low, but it'll be less than uh, thirty seconds. Okay. All right. Let's let's start it over and uh and we will uh here we go. You can't even tell what it is. It's just you know, just a couple of beats, it's not a big deal. All right, y'all. Put that coffee down. Here we go. Yo, what? It's time to put the coffee down. Y'all gather around. Let's talk about sales. What? With Dooner and the Hill, it's about to get ill as we talk about a thrill. Oh! Sales lessons from the last dance is still at the helm, bro. You ain't got a chance. Nope. He inspires all the players to work against the haters and then celebrate. What? Leadership requires vision to give them what they missed in and close the deal with them. So listen up as we flow, coming through your stereo. We're here to talk about sales, yo. All right. Well, All right. Uh, to, to pick up after that, let's let, let's throw you jump right into an elevator pitch. You can wrap your elevator pitch if you like, <laughs> but uh, but we're gonna kick you off. All right, you're stepping in the elevator right now, Trey. Hey, I appreciate it. So here's what Tech's all about. It's all about workforce optimization. Everyone in your organization has mundane, repetitive tasks that they wish they didn't have to do. From the CEO down to the entry-level carrier sales rep. These tasks are often brainless, and they take time away from more important work, like winning new customers, building better customer experiences, and even going to get the coffee and saying hi to people in your office. HubTech is here through RPA to answer all those problems and take those tasks off your plate. So give us a call, and let's, uh, let's get on the phone and talk about how we can help you out. All right. Thank you very much, Trey Gers. You've made it to the ground yeah. floor, and uh, we will be – Checking out Tabby, that automation bot, man. I love like automation. Talk. Automation is great. <laughs> it allows you to, to do things that are productive and not the things that are unproductive. Yeah. Well, Trey, before we dive into, uh, before we dive and break down this survey with you, what was your biggest sort of takeaway from from uh, the last dance? We were talking a bit about what we took from Jordan, Rodman, and, uh, and from Phil as well. Man, that's a loaded question because there's just, so much to take away from it. And, you know, today I want to talk a little bit about vision, but I think what I took away from it 
um, on the overall scale was um, how impressed I were with the professionalism of everybody in that organization. Even with all the craziness, they never got distracted. They always kept their eye on the target and they worked relentlessly to achieve their goal. And I think we took for granted six out of eight championships um, in that run. But watching that documentary and seeing the work that they put in, they weren't just talented people. They worked really, really hard. And I just took away from that that, man, they kept their eye on the prize. They worked ridiculously hard. And uh, they were professional the whole time, even even with Rodman. I mean, when he got on the court, he was a pro's pro. You know, he, he did his job. He did his thing. So it was incredibly impressive. But I just took that away that um, talent is one thing, but hard work is really the, the key there. And uh, you put those two together, and it was almost an unstoppable combination. You know, to me, a character that stuck out was was Pippin, and he's almost like the Greek tragedy of Pippin, where he's this he's this really good player, but he's always in Michael Jordan's shadow. He had the chance to have the mic and have the floor when Jordan was gone. They didn't win a championship there, um, but you could see like you could see that Pippin was always very torn. You know, he respected Jordan; they were really good friends, but he didn't like being in the shadow. He didn't like he felt very disrespected by not being allowed to take a final shot in a game. That's a big plot line in the series. How do you feel about dealing with the the guy who's maybe second best on the team but still really good well you know Pippen is an interesting case study because if you if you go back to his origins he didn't really grow up winning anything he wasn't a winner until he got to Chicago I mean he grew like six inches in college which that's insane in and of itself I wish I had grown even one inch in college <laughs> but he grew six inches in college and really kind of came onto the scene late in his career and he wasn't really a you know part of a winning organization or a winner and being with Jordan stepped his game up. We never would have heard about Scottie Pippen if he hadn't played on those Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan, Phil Jackson. And so I think in his DNA, as good and talented as he was, um, he, he was a number two. And I think he knew he was a number two until Jordan left. And then he felt like he would naturally be the number one, but he still wasn't a number one. He was really a number two. And that's where he thrived. That's where he contributed the most. And when he played that role, that's when they were the strongest. So. Looking at Pippen, he was incredibly talented. He was very good. He worked hard, but he was, mentally, he's a number two. And I think he knew that. I just don't think he knew how to deal with it emotionally. He didn't know how to handle that situation because he, he wasn't a number one. It's tough, too, because basketball, and we mentioned My Michael Jordan sort of transcended the NBA. He made the Bulls a much-watched team. He brought in viewers and people and, and journalists covering the sport who wouldn't otherwise do so, and suddenly there's just so much attention on there. And then it's it's all, you know, you got Pippen, who's just like, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Talk about a data reference. <laughs> yeah, it's not the Brady Bunch, though. Jeez, you've been on enough Zoom calls. They all look like the Brady Bunch. Um, what kind of uh, leadership? Yeah. So here was the first question we asked in the poll. And it was what kind of leadership style do you respond to? And I found the results here really interesting because nobody said demanding. Nobody said demanding at all. But sometimes <laughs> demanding is what you need. Uh, 50% plus said player coach. So a lot of people like the idea of a person who is selling or at least has sold telling them what to do out there when they go out and sell themselves. Um, I, I think you only had one choice here too. So maybe some people were turned because I would also pick as much as I hate, like as much as I hate a lot of demands being put on me and I self motivate a lot. I d having demands put on me. I respond to them pretty well as well. Well, that, you know, that's interesting. And I go back to my days in high school basketball. I had a, I had a, uh, a Bobby Knight disciple as a coach who was very demanding and uh, was difficult to understand. The, what made it helpful was off the court, he was loving, he was caring, and he, he expressed the reasons why he was demanding. I'll never forget, and I tell this story a lot, I'll never forget a day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to air some, some dirty laundry here that's going to be embarrassing, but I hope everybody enjoys it. <laughs> my junior year of high school, um, my coach was riding me like crazy on the basketball court. We were uh, had a losing season going, which was, was unlike our school, and he was just on me that day, like, like just crazy and i literally broke down and was crying in practice now there's nothing much worse than crying at varsity basketball practice in high school but i, I just like i was at a breaking point he set me out for the rest of the practice and afterwards he brought me to his office and he said trey why do you think i'm on you so hard and he went through some things and he mentioned other players that he wasn't as uh, as tough on and he said i'm tough on you because i know you have more and it's my job to get it out so the day that you need to be concerned about is the day that i stop demanding more of you. And it was because of that conversation that I was able to handle the demands moving forward. And we did really well in my senior year. We had a winning season. We won two tournaments, finished second and third, and we, we, did, uh, we did really well. 
It was the relationship and the conversation that made the demand acceptable and something I could handle. I don't think people want somebody who is demanding just to be demanding. They want somebody who is who is who expects a lot, but who truly cares about them and they know it. That's what makes the difference. Um, Bobby Knight's players loved him because, because they knew that he loved them, and so they could handle the demand. Yeah. People outside of it look at it as he's a, he's a tyrannical, you know, jerk. But it's the relationship that matters. And when you look at the results, you know, player coach, that's a relationship. Philosophical and supportive, that, that's more of a relationship type of idea. People want relationships. I don't think it's the demands or the expectations that people are afraid of. I think it's those things without relationship. And that's where leadership, the best leaders, in my opinion, are the ones who invest time in their people and build relationships. And then they can demand and have really high expectations. And people will rise to those because they know that they're cared about. They know they're, they're cared for. And that's where, that's where it's really critical in my opinion. Kevin, how do you feel about How did you answer that question? And, and who do you respond to? You're kind of in a leadership position now, but when you were, when you were doing sales, when you have people telling you what to do, who, who are you listening to? Well, I agree with Trey. 100%. You know, demanding is, is kind of an attribute to these other relationships, right? So in any of these relationships that, that we have here or any that you can think of, demanding is just a, an attribute of that. So someone can be demanding or not demanding, but it's really that underlying core relationship that that it makes it a positive or a negative. Uh, but I, I think player coach. I, I think player coach. Uh, so someone who's out there uh, working harder than anybody else, out hustling everybody. Uh, if you know, I respect in management. I respect those people more, and that's what I aspire to be. I, was, I aspire to, to outwork everybody that I can, and um, and just lead by example. Here, real quick follow up for both of you guys before we move to the next question. We have a few of these to get through. So the follow up is: What wouldn't you respond to at all? What do you think is is the worst method out of those, which were player coach, philosophical, supportive, hands off, demanding? There was also other where someone actually wrote in. Uh, that's kind of I'm not saying that. That's kind of sexist. <laughs> yeah, right here. Uh, but wh- who wouldn't you listen to? Trey. Well, I'll, I'll go first. And again, I think I think if you're just looking at each of these exclusively, demanding would be the one obvious that I, I think would be the least effective without the relationship. Because, and I think they go hand in hand. I was going to comment on on, Ke- on Kevin's uh, thoughts, which I, I thought were excellent. If you have a relationship but you're not demanding, I don't think people respect that either. You know, somebody who is more in a relationship but doesn't hold high expectations for performance. I don't think people respect that either. I really believe they go hand in hand. And the demanding or the expectation is just nuanced by the personality. Some people have more of an easygoing personality, but they still expect a lot. Some people are a little bit more rough around the edges, but they still expect a lot. But again, those two components, relationship and demanding, have to go together. Uh, you can't have one without the other and be a really effective leader, in my opinion. So I would say standalone, definitely demanding is not very, uh, very productive. Um, but that's just if you take away the relationship side. To what degree, and this was the next one we asked, was to what degree does having a vision help drive your sales goals and help you buy into leadership? Helps a lot, 70%. So a lot of people really buying into a vision. And then uh, nearly 30%, so that's almost 100% there, said somewhat helps. Very small amount said neutral, and, and another small amount said not at all. And I would agree with that as well. It really helps to have a picture and an idea and a goal of where you need to be and where the team needs to be and what those expectations are and what those demands are. What about vision, though, inspired you to, to want us to include this question in the uh, in the survey trade. Well, there's an ancient Hebrew proverb that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I believe that is true in every situation in life, whether it's a business, an organization, whether it's a family, whether it's a sports team. I don't think it matters what it is. If you have somebody who has a vision and they're able to communicate that and then hold on to that vision, then everybody can align. Everybody can get in step and move in that direction and chaos becomes order and productivity occurs. And one thing I like to talk about with leaders, and I've learned this from some incredible leaders in my life, is that you know leaders own the destination. Um, one of the things that, that I'm doing right now is I'm trying to lose weight. Um, I, you know, the, the, the COVID-15 definitely got me. Uh, I didn't eat very well at the very beginning, and I didn't like how I felt. And one of the things that I did for myself was I actually pulled up a picture from me from back in 2013 when I was in really good shape. I'd been working out and just taking care of myself. And I had a picture of myself. And so I literally 
printed off that picture and I put it inside one of the cabinets in our kitchen. And that may be really weird, but the reason I did that was because I wanted to hold on to that vision of what I was going after. I wanted to keep that in the forefront of my mind because in my mind, it's like a little organization. And so that vision has helped me make the choices and believe I can do it so that now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm about seven pounds away from my goal. I've lost 20 pounds in the last five weeks, which is awesome, but it's because I've held on to that vision. Now take that picture and put it into an organization. If you have a leader who can hold that vision, hold that destination, and make sure that the team understands that and everybody's moving in that direction, you're going to get there a lot faster and everybody's going to be much happier because they're rowing in the same direction because that destination is being held by the leader and being reminded into everybody that this is where we're headed, this is what we're doing, and everybody's Everybody's you know rowing in that direction, and that's powerful. Yeah, Kevin, uh, Trey, Trey's before. inspired. Uh, skinny Trey's inspired by Heavy Trey, or Heavy Trey's inspired by Skinny Trey, one way or the other. Uh, for us, vision, like for me, one of the most recent things we're having a vision really helped was when we were doing Freight Waves live at home. We had to pivot and convert this live event to a virtual event, but uh, a core team of us who really knew what we wanted it to look like and be in a vision guided by our CEO and founder, Craig Fuller, really helped set the map. And then Craig has always just been really good about being sort of hands off unless there's really a problem that he has to he has to put out. But Kevin, what, what does vision mean to you and all this stuff? It is kind of unimaginable me unimaginable to me to, to go without vision. I, you know, I, I visualize everything. I, I know kind of where I, I want to be uh, in, in all facets of my life, five, ten years. This is not detailed or anything, but I have a vision that I'm working toward. You know, I have goals. Uh, to just be visionless is 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 so awkward for me to even imagine that I, I don't think I could, you know, but I think I have been in a company or two that, that really didn't have a vision. They're, they're just like, just trying to, to keep up, uh, just trying to keep the lights on uh, in, in a lot of ways, just trying to, to keep the status quo, just keep on going at the, you know, the, the same status quo, keep that, keep things somewhat orderly, but no real vision. And those are horrible places to work. Uh, but, but to me, it's, it's, it really is unimaginable to, 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 to live life without, you know, a, a vision or, or goals. All right, we're talking about basketball. So, all right, we're talking about basketball and putting up a shot clock because we have a few more of these to get through. So, you got a sixty-second shot clock on the rest of these. How transparent? How transparent are you with your team and their performance, or is your manager transparent with you? Uh, extremely transparent was thirty-five, and then fairly transparent was forty. Somewhat transparent, fifteen percent. Not at all, ten percent. Other was five percent. Transparency is a big thing, right? This was a big theme in the show. It came up on the court a lot with Michael Jordan getting in people's faces. Phil, you know, Phil being the Zen master, but trying to give people lessons through all these challenges and adversity. How do you feel about transparency? And it's a sensitive thing, Trey. How do you get it out there to people? Well, I think it goes to the authenticity of the leader. You know, uh, people, genuine leaders, in my opinion, understand the value of transparency and the value of accountability. I would even throw that word in more than transparency. It's really accountability. And so a leader who is not like holding their team accountable, again, is a leader that really doesn't have high expectations. We hold people to the expectation that we set when we believe that's where they should be. And then if we don't, then we, if we hide things or we don't hold them accountable, we don't communicate very well. So um, I, I think, it, I think it, it, it's stunning here that 70%, you know, we go back earlier, 70% said the vision helps. But then only 35% say that their leaders are pretty transparent about, about their performance, about doing that. To me, there's just a disconnect right there. Good stuff. There you go. And you didn't even beat the shotgun. Hey, Kevin, you, your turn. Yeah, transparency is all about your, your communication skills and about painting that picture of that vision. So painting that picture in as detailed as you can get, that, that picture of your vision is, is what transparency is. Good stuff. Good stuff. And then uh, what was, uh, well, let's see, what was the next one we got on here? It is talking about how much effort, and by the way, my opinion on transparency, I think it's it's definitely needed. I'd much rather have someone tell me to my face uh, if there's a performance issue or something like that than have, than have meetings going on in the background and then taking that control away from me and delaying my time to improve. So if there's something going wrong, let me know. And that, that goes out there. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it. Um, how much effort do you put into making talented but challenging personalities work with your team? This can happen a lot of times in 
in sales, you get someone who's really good, but they don't help anybody else out or they don't follow the rules or they don't use the CRM or whatever it may be. They, this, this team said that they put a lot in 45%. A lot of our, our viewers said in another 30% said some, uh, only a few said very little, but 15% said they'll fire you. They don't put up with anything. You don't follow the status quo. You're gone. Uh, Trey, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that one? Yeah, we should we should have the, the we fire them people, let them know who they are, just so we're all aware of that. But what, what I would say to that is, um, you know, I I think that I think that something that still did better than probably any. I don't know that anybody could have coached that team of personalities to that level of success outside of Phil Jackson. Maybe there's some others that could do it. But what I thought he did really well was he got to know what made his players tick. I can't imagine any NBA coach today allowing Dennis Rodman to do what he did in the middle of a championship season and in the middle of the NBA finals when he took a vacation and when he went wrestling. And that's cra- that's crazy. But Phil knew Rodman well enough to know that when he came back, he was going to give everything and there wasn't, he wasn't going to miss a beat. He knew that about him because he invested time in Dennis Rodman and he did that with all of his players. And here's what I think happened. When a leader invests in getting to know how their people tick, I think it rubs off on everybody else. And everybody goes, hey, Phil's okay with Dennis being gone. He knows he's going to be back. It's not, not that Phil's okay with it, but he allowed it because he knew that when Rob came, he came back, he was going to be great. They didn't find him. They didn't suspend him. He went in and had a great game. So I think it's investing in people and getting to know what makes them tick. Yeah. Uh, Ke- Kevin, would, would you agree with that? It, it can be a challenge. And, and again, you always have to navigate those waters. Are, are you enabling bad behavior? Are you having team go, well, you let him do it. Why don't you let me do it? Uh, the problem is most of us are in right to work state. So just because someone did something doesn't necessarily mean you get to, they might've earned that. Uh, they might've earned that cred. Uh, they, they might have. And, and I, I would think that in freight brokers, <laughs> There is a lot of time spent on odd personalities because this industry is is made up of, especially in freight brokers, there's a lot of odd personalities in freight brokers. So I would imagine that, that I, I agree with this, a lot of time is, is, is spent on managing challenging personalities. Chris Seed says, no one cares about you more than someone who is constantly holding you accountable. And yeah, I, I agree with that, Chris, uh, when people start talking, when people stop talking to you, that usually means that, uh, especially if they used to, they're probably looking for someone else or probably looking for your replacement because you've disappointed them enough. They don't have the energy to, to speak to you anymore. Here's one. Here's, here's a big one that comes up in sales offices and it's account distribution. Michael Jordan says we are entitled to defend what we have until we lose it. How do you feel about accounts? Michael Jordan didn't say about accounts. This is how do you feel about accounts being reassigned due to a lack of performance? And you know what? A lot of people agreed. Uh, 35% said that they agree. 30% said they somewhat agree. There's some neutral. 15% said disagree. Those are probably the same 15% who fire everybody with challenging personalities. Uh, what do you think, Trey? Is it S or get off the pot? Well, I, I think so. I mean, you know, customers are the lifeblood of your business, and that's where that's where the that's game time. That's where the performance hits. And if somebody's not cutting it, obviously, you want to put them through a process and make sure that you know they're getting the proper training and coaching so they can succeed. But if it's just not in the cards for them, if it's you know, if, if you're just not a good shooter, you got to stop shooting three pointers, right? I mean, that's just kind of the nature of the thing. So if you're not good with these accounts and you're not able to make strides through coaching and training then absolutely I agree with that because, again, those accounts are the lifeblood of your business or your, your revenue, uh, both now and in the future. And I just think that that's, that's the game time situation that you have, to, uh, you have to put the best players on the court. And that's, uh, that's how I do that. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. I, when I was, I would go into my CRM and you would see that there was no correspondence or interaction with an account that may either that fall into your territory now where you were doing research or someone referred you to go check them out. And then you go check with your manager. Can I have this reassigned? There's been no activity. And then they don't enable you to do so. That can be highly frustrating because sometimes these people squat on these accounts for no apparent reason whatsoever. Kevin, what do you think? I, I, I agree with both of you guys. I, I, I am surprised it is so low. You know, 35% agree, and then 30. So there's about two out of three uh, somewhat agree and, and, and agree. And I, I would think that would be even higher than that. I mean, because if you're underperforming, if you're not getting the job done, it, it needs to be reassigned. I mean, it's, it's that simple, and everyone should believe in those rules. And if you believe in those rules, then your performance will be be higher. 
Hey, hey, Trey, we got to we gotta get a book away and get some shout-outs out. This time flies way too quick, but good thing you're a sponsor all month long. We're going to have more Hub Tech on here and break down a lot of these things. But in the meantime, how do they go and check out the Word on the Street and, uh, and Hub Tech? Yeah, so go to our website, gohubtech, that's H-U-B-T-E-K dot com. You'll learn all about Tabby and about the other solutions that we, that we offer. Uh, my lunch on Friday is at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I always post about on LinkedIn. I put the Zoom uh, link on there. It's open to anybody. Come and join and check out you know, what's going on. Some fabulous transportation professionals in that lunch every week. Um, and those are the best ways to reach out to me on LinkedIn with a, you know, a connection or a DM. would love to talk to anybody about automation, about how we can help them out in that way. Thanks, Ice Trey. We really appreciate your time Thank today. You. It was great having you on the air, man. Uh, yeah, always great to hear from Trey and these these topics. They always go by so quick because there's such a uh, there's such a big nugget to pull out here. But I have a question for the audience too before the show ends. What motivates you guys to sell? Leave your comment here. I'll read them out. I'm I'm very excited and interested to see what this community thinks about all this stuff. Speaking of communities, uh, when, uh, in the show notes of this and the article we post, there's the Glenn Garys. That's our our communal lead list, and I don't mean lead list to solicit. I mean lead list to share information to to make friends, to get guidance. There's 40 million Americans unemployed. Everybody knows somebody who probably needs some help right now. So network in there and see if you can get help or you can give help or you can extend a hand. And uh, I think that especially in these trying times in so many different ways, anything you do to be positive and to help somebody is going to make you feel better. And I think that with a lot of us, this, this whole situation, just the mental health behind it weighs on you too, right, Kevin? It does. It does. And that's the reason why the Glen Gary list is so good, especially right now, as you said, with all the unemployed, it's a great way to go out, network, find a job, find a new hire, find challenging personalities. If that's what you're trying to look for, the, the, those, those diamonds in the rough, uh, but it's a, a way for us all to come together and, and help each other out. Now, Kevin, sometimes you meet friends, and sometimes they're lifelong friends. Sometimes you might even meet them while you're a child, and sometimes your sister might contact me on LinkedIn <laughs> and send me a childhood picture of Kevin Hill. If uh, production could put that up on the screen right now, that would be amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that gentleman there, she, I promised her I would have this. It's not that embarrassing. Actually, Emily nah. thinks that you boys look very cute. Do you, uh, I don't know if you can see the picture on your end. Do you recognize the gentleman in that photograph? Uh, yeah, it's uh, David Imrathama, who uh, listens sometimes and, and comments uh, occasionally. Speaking of comments, Jonathan A. Payne says, Trey Griggs, leaders own the destination. Good call, man. The ones putting in the work after hours, not taking their lunch breaks, not taking not taking their lunch break to work, prospecting on the weekends, always looking to improve their left-handed dribble can still get Jordan-like results. Leaders putting the work. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a lot mm -hmm. of hard work. Life is a lot of hard work. Little surprise. She's, she's, uh, she's laughing at this photograph. I don't know why. I think it's a perfectly <laughs> fine photograph. Kevin, what book are we giving away this week, man? So, so we are giving away, uh, and I forgot to bring the copy up here because I, I came up here and we did this test and it threw me off of my schedule. So I'm going to blame you for that. Uh, but it's uh, Stan Duncan's it book. That, that you sent, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Wherever you go, there you are. And it's uh, the meditation book that we talked about last week with Stan Duncan. Okay, I'm going to draw for it right now. And then next week, we're going to give away the book that Michael Neme recommended to tie in with this one, yes. Relentless, From Good to Great to Unstoppable by Tim Grover. But right now, we have 60 names. Let's put them in the random number generator. It is number 37. Let's see who number 37 is. It's Robert Bain. Robert Bain, you have won the book. Congratulations, sir. That is now yours. How do you feel? How do you feel about winning that one, Robert? <laughs> he should feel good. So, so um, it was a Mike, uh, Mike Fulham from from Read TMS sent me a picture of of that book. He he went online and bought it himself this uh, this last week. I think he sent it to me on Saturday or Sunday, but it just uh, arrived at his door. So he's reading it as well. And I recommend it to, to everyone who who kind of wants to, to get into the head of maybe um, uh, of I, I, the Bulls head coach. Oh, he says, that, uh, what's his name? I wouldn't say Phil Knight, but that's the owner of Nike. No, Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson, yes. That's right. Gregory, Gregory Grimes <laughs> says, I'd love to see a follow-up documentary, Jordan, the Washington Wizard years. No, nobody wants to see it. That's like watching like <laughs> Joe Montana, the, uh, the Chiefs Kansas. years, Tom Brady, the Buccaneers years. I'm predicting right now. It's just, it's not going to, it's not going to end well for Tommy. It's going to end like, uh, it's going to end like a Favre on the Favre, Vikings. Yeah. Favre on the Vikings says, yeah, not like Peyton on the, the, the Broncos, probably. 
Nope. Couple shout outs here. Chris Facey Freightburger says, uh, great to connect. Great podcast. Really enjoy the super relevant topic. Really impressed with you guys. Chris Facey, he simplifies logistics and decreases freight spend for businesses. So Chris, thank you for reaching out. Brandon Dawson. He calls himself a dragon slayer. He says, hello, Timothy. Thank you for reaching out. I am surprised we are not connected already. I look forward to four other conversations and your, and your show is there be dragons. Brandon Dawson. Uh, he's in sales. Maybe one day he can show us how to slay some Kevin. Yes, maybe so. Slice, slice some dragons. Yeah, slice some dragons. Bonnie Parkinson, she says, good morning. I was wondering if I could be added to the Put That Coffee Down book. Love the podcast, by the way. Yeah, all you have to do to be mm-hmm. to be added into the book drawing, all you have to do is leave your name here, say you want to be in the drawing, or put a comment on, on any of our things. Connect with Kevin Hill, at Kevin Hill on, on the LinkedIn. You can connect with me, at Timothy Dooner. That's D-O-O-N-E-R on LinkedIn or at Timothy Dooner on Twitter. More than happy to get you on there. Richard Garza says, Phil Jackson said something along the lines of, you are only a success the moment you are a success. Celebrate the wins, then get back to it. Uh, coming up later today at 2 o'clock is Freight and I was coming up on What the Truck, though. I got Trevor Milton on Friday noon. Trevor Milton, CEO, Nicola. They just had a big announcement. They're going to come on the show to talk about it. Super excited to have Trevor Milton on there. We're also going to have Wayne Craig and Dave Abels telling their story from the road. Well, they're out there, and we're also going to have... Molo, come on. Molo Solutions. They gave a big donation during last What the Truck to the St. Christopher's Truckers Relief Fund. I got friends only want to talk business. I got expensive to win and expensive. I got expensive to win and expensive. I've been winning all the war. And I've been shutting down the stars. Yeah. Cause when it rains and it pours. Yeah. And I'm ready for some more. Yeah. 